Hi, and welcome to Empowered Marketing by Professor Hines. This podcast is devoted to beginning marketers and owners of small businesses. We're here to help you learn social media marketing. Each episode presents important elements in social media marketing that you can use in your campaigns to generate better results, especially more business. Empowered Marketing is exclusively sponsored by AQ'd Marketing Services in Orange County, California. AQ'd Marketing Services serves small and mid-sized businesses in the areas of strategic marketing consultation, social media marketing using all forms of social media, campaign creation and management in both paid and owned media, pay-per-click campaigns, search engine optimization, graphic design, and videography. AQ Marketing is owned and managed by me, Professor Joe Hines. My experience includes over 20 years of Fortune 100 Corporation Marketing Management, as well as 10 years of academic work as professor at California State University Fullerton, Concordia University, Biola University, Cal Baptist University, and Fullerton College. You can find out more about AQ Marketing Services. Use the link on the home page of this podcast or call A Cubed Marketing at 7127261 Hello all as I sit down to publish this episode it's Christmas Eve I'd like to wish everyone a very happy holiday season. Of course, if you're listening to this at any other point in the year, it isn't. So whether it is or not, make today a great day. Today in episode 20 of the Empowered Marketing Podcast, we'll finish off our discussion about the social commerce zone. We'll talk about how social commerce tools can be applied during the third and fourth stages of the consumer journey, alternative evaluation and purchase. We'll look at how social commerce tools can be applied to consumer advocacy, and I'll share an example of a program used by a restaurant chain called Silver Diner. With regard to testimonials, we'll talk about best practices that should be included in any testimonial campaign. And then we'll turn our attention to the six elements of influence and how understanding them can improve your social media marketing. Be sure and access the PowerPoint presentation I've made to go along with today's episode. You can download it using the link you found with this post. If you'd like to talk with me about how the information can be put to work in the context of your business, you can also schedule a free consultation meeting with me, find a Calendly app on the home page of my website, or go to https colon double forward slash calendly.com forward slash a hyphen cubed underscore marketing forward slash introductory hyphen consultation to schedule with me. So let's head over to the lecture hall at Whittier College. So we've talked a lot about transparency and reviews and like I showed you earlier um, I've got some interesting statistics that go along with it. So 25% of consumers have seen reviews that they believe to be fake. So this is why transparency is so important because I got to if if it's all 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 good news I'm going to quit buying into it. 21% have seen customers receive pay or other incentives to post positive reviews, which is why the whole theory about this is too good to be true gets so um cemented in over time. 81% find it difficult to distinguish between what is authentic user content or what is actually advertising. Incentivized reviewers are less likely than non-incentivized reviewers to give a one-star rating and four times less likely to be critical in the review. So with statistics like this and so much you know gamesmanship going on it's easy to see why a lot of consumers when they see reviews feel like you know this deck is stacked 
a little bit and how much can I believe in this information? Which is why authenticity is so important, which is why you have to include a mixed bag of comments in order for the positive ones to really be effective. Okay. Now we've moved past awareness and research and we're into evaluating the alternatives. And tactics that we use in social commerce to do this would include, for instance, um, barcode scanning and price comparisons. There's actually sites and apps out there where you can take the barcode of a product and input it into the app and it'll show you comparative pricing for the product in a number of different venues. So uh, this is, here's an example called Buy Via. And this actually shows you, you know, different places where the product that you're thinking of buying is available and what prices it's being sold at. Here it is. So they're showing us, you know, food coupons, things for Black Friday, things for Cyber Monday. They've got clothes, they've got things for the home, smartphone related, eBay related. And let's say that I was interested in buying this Logitech uh, wireless keyboard for my iPad. It's gonna show me the price right now. I should be able to buy it for $19 in shipping on Amazon. But if I was anywhere inside a store, Best Buy, it would show me the pricing at Best Buy versus Amazon. If I was in a different store, it would show me the pricing for that store versus Amazon and Best Buy. And what it's doing is it's giving me as a shopper a lot of power in my decision making. Because I'm really gonna be able to buy smart if I know who's got it and what, where it's priced at in each of these locations, okay? Traditionally, Consumer, I mean, retailers never let you price com compare them until the internet became a thing. And then they started saying, hey, we'll match. You bring us in any internet deal and we'll match price. And it's things like buy via that have led to that whole difference in approach now. This is price.com. Shop like a pro with new use and rental options at your fingertips. And again, in here, I'm gonna see, uh, I'm gonna see a, my, you know, a price comparison happening in real time. They've got a nice video that I'll play you that explains this site and what it can do. Welcome to price.com. It's easy to get started and free to use. To try it out, simply click the button, add to Chrome. Let's say you're shopping on Amazon for a KitchenAid mixer. This gray one looks perfect. Price now searches for the exact product match on thousands of stores. Next, click the button to find the lowest price. Now you can see all your shopping options, new, used, refurbished, rental, and unbranded in one place. First, I'm gonna start with new. Looks like you can get it from Walmart for $210. Next, I'm gonna take a look at my used options. Wow, looks like I can buy one from OfferUp for only $100. Price.com, shop like a pro. Isn't that cool? I mean, it, it shows you exactly where you ought to go to buy anything, and you're always going to get the best deal that you can get. That, that's really neat. So now we're into phase four, the purchase phase, okay? And the tactics that are available to us would include shop within network options, so meaning shop within the social network site itself, so you can buy on Facebook. You guys have all seen the, uh, the little shopping area at the bottom of the Facebook page. There's a thing called InstaShop. Snapchat has deep links that allow you to buy online through Snapchat. So here's an example from Facebook, where here I input, you know, um, I was looking for, uh, you, you know, cars. And so the cars page comes up and I'm looking at the Camry or maybe a big, huge, you know, bus thing or Corolla, Honda Civic, whatever. And it's, you know, if I click into any of these, I'm gonna get a lot more information about that vehicle and um, what's on it and the price it's being sold at and whatnot. Social shopping. I mentioned that they've got these online malls that have a bunch of small stores covering all kinds of categories, just like you would find at the Brea Mall or any other mall. So Wanala, you guys ever been to Wanala before? So here's Wanalo, and this is this one mall. And in here, these are all of the different, quote, stores 
that Wana Lo has in it, and they're across lots of different categories. So, you know, Sway Chic, for instance, if I click in here, it's, you know, women's clothing and jewelry and things. So 2020 Avenue. So this is the kind of merchandise that they have here. So it's just like a lot of the stores that you'd find in any mall, right? Peer-to-peer -peer marketing um, or marketplaces. So what's Etsy, obviously? Connects people looking for unique goods with independent sellers around the world. And when you shop on Etsy, you can choose from millions of handmade vintage and craft supply items created and curated by millions of independent sellers. So it's a little bit like an eBay, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Right. You guys ever shop on that site? You ever bought anything on Etsy? You have. What did you buy? Um, I bought a few things, um, mostly vintage clothing. I collect vintage clothing. Oh, you do? I sell it, so I have like, I don't know, I have a few sellers that I'm pretty like close with on there. Actually, one's from Malaysia. Really? But yeah, like I, I source a lot of my stuff. <laughs> so do you sell, you sell stuff on Etsy too? Um, yeah, I do sometimes, but that's not my primary. What's your primary? Uh, I like Depop too, I like eBay, and then I also use Grail too for like more like higher end. So this whole lecture tonight, this is totally in your, yeah. yeah, this is right in your ballpark. That's great. And group buys. So you, we're all familiar with Groupon, right? Do you guys ever take advantage of Groupon or Living Social? All the time. Yeah. Clutch. Sorry? Yeah, it's clutch. And then stage five. This is the final stage in, in the whole buyer's journey, right? The post-purchase evaluation. So there are a lot of tactics within the social commerce universe that we can take advantage of. Um, one would be comments that are posted by customers actually on their own pages. Or maybe there are requests or comments that are made by potential customers on a company's page. And you know the people look at the kind of exchange of information. What did the brand or the company say? in response to that. There's also participation in loyalty programs. Here's an example of how one restaurant group actually takes advantage of a loyalty program that they run through social media and how it not only helps their customers but it also helps them generate more business. The article was written by the guy who's the marketing manager at the restaurant group. And he said, modernizing loyalty is a challenge that hospitality organizations have to address. Consumers have less time to spend with brands, and as a result, they increasingly demand utility from the relationship, meaning that they want it to be easy to do business, and they want to be able to interact with favorite brands in the channels where they spend time, which today is social media and mobile. Then he says, for Silver Diner, for the company I work for, these trends have led us to embrace a loyalty program that provides utility and rewards to our Eat Well, Do Well club members for their social actions. So what they're wanting to have their patrons do is post socially about Silver Diner in exchange for some reward. We use a loyalty platform from this company called Patronics to manage customer wallets over mobile while using Chirpify to manage the social engagement program. By pairing these technologies, meaning Patronics and Chirpify, we're able to reward Silver Diner Club members with social and messaging channels for specific behaviors. Within, we reward them within social and messaging channels for specific behaviors. After linking a member's number with their social profile, Silver Diner customers are rewarded with points for every eligible social action, meaning engagement, right, meaning post, that they make on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. Customers can earn up to five points every month, which translate into $5 off their next visit. So basically a buck a post. Engagement loyalty is helping Silver Diner create a cycle with greater engagement and sharing that drives customer acquisition and participation. As members and participation increase, so does its impact to the business, all resulting in net new top-line value. Silver Diner has experienced firsthand 
The benefits of rewarding loyalty program members through social channels, including, first one, increased participation with the brand. By keeping people in their channel of choice, they're more likely to participate with us. In addition, social loyalty encourages greater engagement and participation because customers are rewarded for doing so. Two, increased earned media. So as the most loyal customers share positive experiences over social media, we, Silver Diner, earn valuable, uh, we, we receive valuable earned media. As customers advocate on our behalf, that message is shared within their network, in turn encouraging a web of people to engage and become loyal to Silver Diner increasing customer acquisition. Three. Greater customer knowledge. In the process of linking offline and online data about loyal customers, we're gathering important information, which we previously could not access. We're learning what demographics engage most, which campaigns are most successful in these channels, and we expect to learn a lot more. We're also seeing revenue growth and lifetime customer value growth. So powerful, right? Now, a little while ago, we were saying that in terms of transparency and authenticity, when other people know that the posts that you're receiving are paid for, the authenticity comes down. That's one argument away from what these guys are doing, right? Because they're basically paying a buck a post in terms of money off on your next trip here. So that's the downside, but the upside is all the things that this guy just told us about. So, you know, one thing to take away from this is that for every tactic, there's both pluses and minuses, right? And you have to make your decision yourself when you're running the brand as to which way are you gonna lean. Nothing's perfect. All right, so we've talked about most of these moments of truth already. Zero moment of truth is how receptive to an offer from a brand has prior exposure to social media made you, okay? Then there's the first moment of truth, which is, did you actually, when you were in the store, pick the product up and put it in your cart? The second one was, when you went home and you used the product, were you as pleased about it as you'd hoped you'd be based on what you'd already learned about in your social, right? Now the third moment of truth is, are you gonna go out and be an advocate for the brand? Are you gonna start creating your own content? Are you gonna post a testimonial? Are you gonna go to their Yelp page? Whatever. Okay, so let's look at what are some of the best ways that we should implement a testimonial campaign. Since this third moment of truth, the, the testimonial or the advocacy is so important, what are some things that we should do if we create that kind of a tactic on our, on our campaign? Well, number one, it should be authentic. So it's got to be transparent. It's got to be true. It's got to have some good mix in with the bad or some bad mix in with the good. Two, transparent, meaning if I've incentivized or somehow compensated people to be posting favorably about my brand, I need to let people know that I'm doing that. So I just mentioned the fact that the guy that worked for the Silver Diner had been paying people to put those posts out there. At least he's being transparent about it, right? He wrote the article saying that this is what we do and it works for us. Third thing is advocacy. It's important that they create the testimonials on our behalf. I need to create the opportunities for them to do it. I should open up and publish a Yelp page. I should give them access to maybe dropping comments in on my Facebook page or my website. Participatory, meaning I have to encourage customers to actually create those reviews or participate. Reciprocity, if somebody does something nice for me, I need to turn around and scratch their back too minimally by a thank you or like what they're doing at that diner and hey if you post something great about us we're going to give you for every time you do it up to five times a month a dollar off on your next visit with us that's reciprocity 
And then finally, it should be infectious, meaning it should be considered a cool thing to do, a fun thing to do, make it easy and popular to do it. Next follow-up question is, how can marketers build a strong base of these good reviews? Well, I can educate people about my products. Meaning, if I'm gonna get them to review it, first of all, I need to be able out there publicizing it and sharing information and creating that owned media that hopefully will become earned media later. I, I need to identify within my group of prospects which people are most likely to do it and then I need to start sending them opportunities and suggestions that they actually do create the content. So one way to do that, I have a client called ServePro. You guys know who ServePro is? They do, like if your home has fire or flood damage, they go in and they do all the restoration work. Well, my client has um, uh, a program where after they've had a technician or a team out at somebody's house, when they're there, they leave a leave behind there that says, hey, if you like the job we did for you today, please go to our Yelp page and go to our Facebook page and make a comment about what we did for you. So that's identifying the people who are most likely to do that and then creating some opportunity for them to actually do it, okay? So I wanna show you one example of that sort of uh, thing, that, another example of what we did for that same client. So here's a customer in Anaheim Hills, where they were actually maybe Yorba Linda, where they went in and they did some restoration work after a flood in his kitchen. Thank you, Mr. Lambert, for uh, allowing me to come up today. Uh, appreciate being here. And, and uh, could you tell me a bit about uh, what happened with you and the, the situation? Well, uh, about a week or so ago, a week and a half, uh, the, uh, I had been doing some re uh, remodeling, not actual remodeling in the kitchen, but adding some moldings and stuff like that to the cabinets. And, uh, a uh, month or so ago, I had completed uh, thing, and uh, a week or two ago, the wife uh, walked by and said, uh, Mom, they're holding it off. What? Uh -oh. <laughs> How did this be? Uh -oh. I did it nice and even. I completed the job, and I went over to the sure that. And I tried to check to see what was wrong, because I went down the side of the cabinet, uh, and it had swollen up, and I was boy, why is there a guy in here? Actually, Pop the wood there, pop the moment. So I started checking for moisture, and sure enough, and moisture went around the cabinets to the kitchen wall to get the sink and stuff like that. I found moisture. So uh, we called up our uh, Hartford insurance agent and to have a you know, moisture in the wall there and affect our cabinets and wondering just, you know, what we should do next. And uh, so right away he had us contact uh, ServPro and uh, got a hold of them and they, they came out right away and uh, started checking for things and sure as heck we got moisture leak and stuff and uh, let's see touring with the uh, the wall there they, they sent they sent out a plumber and uh, yeah you have a crack great pipe in your wall uh, uh, her pro, uh, went to work and uh, great team great great people they came in there and they actually kind of a calming force for this stressful situation but you know we were in here being senior citizens we sure the heck didn't need to you know we're leaking our kitchen again and you know problem so once they pulled everything and then you know they had to leak and there was some mold in there so uh, of course they uh, cleaned everything up and pulled the cabinets and uh, now we're kind of waiting on contractors and stuff to uh, put our kitchen back together but like i said the uh the serve pro people were just professionals okay so it goes on like that but you can see you know the sort of a thing and it's when you see an actual customer with a real face and a real name you can tell it's a real thing it's that much more convincing to bring people into your business you know so that's a that's one example so we're identifying the people who are most likely to share their opinions and we're giving them opportunities to do it provide the tools that make it easier to share the opinion. So in this case, they didn't have to write anything. All they needed to do was tell their story, you know, and 
somebody from my company goes out with a tripod and a camera and just sets up and shoots it. You know, in this case, it was me doing it. And um, it worked out great for the client. Studying how, when, and where opinions are shared. Well, there are certain moments, you know, that each of the technicians that works for the owner of that Surpro franchise can tell when customers are super happy about the work that they did. And they were able to identify, look, if you call this guy in your Belinda, he's going to be a great lead for you. And we were able to go in there many times and capture those things. So it's understanding how, when, and where. And then listening and responding to supporters and detractors and neutrals, meaning listening to your customers and knowing who's happy about the work we do, who isn't, and who's neutral, and then doing the things properly internally at the company to write the things that are going wrong and stress and emphasize the things that you've done well, which also loops right back around again to the whole CRM model because and another important facet of CRM is it should be a learning experience for the entire organization, meaning knowing where did we screw up or what did we do really right, and if things were wrong in one area, then how do I educate my organization about how to avoid those in the future, and how do we continue to train and perpetuate right behavior so that we've got happier customers going forward? Okay. Now, Another real important thing that I've talked about and I've referenced a few times tonight is the idea of influence. Meaning, how do you um, uh, persuade customers to not only try your product for a first time, but buy it, and also not just to buy it, but then to talk about it online and engage and repeat and give you earned media? Well, there's a whole school of thought in this thing and one of the things that we leverage is called social proof. So social proof is considered to be very important when, well, here's an example. Let's say that have you ever been in a social situation totally new to you and you're not exactly sure how to behave or what to do in that moment. So instead of doing anything at first, you step back and you watch the people around you and you say, what? how are other people dealing in this situation and then kind of copying their example? Does that sound familiar to anything that you've ever been involved with? Not knowing what to do, watching the people around you and then doing that thing? Does that at all sound familiar in any way? It should. It's pretty common human behavior, okay? Um, let's say that you're at a restaurant. You don't really know what to order. You've never been there before, but you're out to you know, dinner with some friends that have gone here before. Have you ever asked the question, well, what's good here? Okay, well, that's a real obvious example of you know, this influence opportunity, meaning that the be other people's behavior or their, quote, social proof is something that you require in order to feel better about the decision that you yourself are going to make. That's all that really says, okay? Now, social authority is who are you emulating? Social, um, uh, the first one I talked about, social proof says, what do I do? But social authority, on the other hand, says, what do I do and who do I emulate? Who do I emulate? So when an individual or an organization is seen as an expert in some field, other people are likely to follow that. And we see that kind of behavior in a lot of places. You ever heard the term in management called benchmarking? Benchmarking is when a company all of a sudden finds themselves in a new situation and they're thinking, we're not sure what to do. Let's take a look at what other companies in other industries or maybe in our same industry do and we'll do that thing. Okay? What they're doing is they're looking at companies that they think are competent and great in their fields and they figure if that was the right decision for them, they're a successful company, let's do that thing. They're leveraging social authority, okay? So we do the same thing as people. The reason that influence leaders that we've talked about in prior weeks are influential is because we respect who they are. For instance, Walter Payton has been a spokesperson for multiple brands before, okay? Why? Well, usually they're sports brands 
And if anybody is a good person to pattern themselves after in sports, maybe Walter Payton's that guy. It's the same reason why Nike chose Michael Jordan once to be, you know, the, the guy behind their whole line of Jordan shoes. Okay. Well, there's a guy who has been very, very influential in this whole area of the psychology of influence. His name is Robert Cialdini. Okay, and he's written two really good books on this. The first one is The Psychology of Persuasion, right? Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion. And the other one is called Presuasion. Now, Presuasion starts from the perspective that that zero moment of truth starts from, which is how likely has social media or other forms already made you in terms of buying or following a brand, okay? And the psychology of uh, persuasion is all about how, what are the factors that people are influenced by, and then if those are the factors, how do we take those factors and integrate them into our marketing? So there are six of these. The first one is social proof. So I already mentioned social proof when I said that when we're at the dinner table at a restaurant we've never been to and we ask people what's good here, it's because we don't know what to do. But if other people that we know and respect have bought that product, we're gonna feel better doing it. By the way, those people that we are emulating, we're emulating because we think that they are a social authority. At least in going to the restaurant, hey, I've eaten with my friends before. I generally like what they like. If they like this, I'll probably like it too. I'm gonna buy that. Affinity has a lot to do with do I like the brand or do I like the person? If I'm thinking that there's a deal on right now and I better act before Friday because the deal's off if I buy it after Friday, that's an example of scarcity. Meaning I have to buy within a certain time frame or I'm not gonna get the discounted deal or the rebate or whatever is at stake, okay? That's a scarcity thing. Reciprocity says if you do something for me, I will do something for you, okay? And so that could be, for instance, the reason that blogs work really well is because we're creating a relationship over time in which the reader of your company's blog has been helped many times in the past by the advice that you provided. And every time that you provided winning advice to the guy that maybe hasn't bought from you, but it was a great blog that actually helped the person, you've upped the ante a little bit more that eventually he's going to feel beholden to you and he's going to buy your stuff. He started to like you because you keep pulling him out of a ditch. You've gained the position of authority because your advice is usually right. He's seen other people benefit from your products. In fact, it was one of those people that turned you on to the blog in the first place. The scarcity thing is, I'm not really sure where else to go, and he's got an offer on right now, and it's only gonna be here until Friday, so I need to buy it, I might as well do it now, and I already like the guy. All of those things are coming into play now. The final one, the consistent, consistency thing is, when I got you to read my blog, that was your first yes. When I got you to agree with a couple of the points that I made and some of the solutions that I suggested you actually tried, that was a future yeses along the way. Finally, today, I'm asking you to go out and buy my product. That's the biggest request that you've made of me so far. The rest of them have all been pretty risk-free, low-stakes deals. I've never been asked to lay money out before. But all the other ones have worked out pretty well for me. So I don't really have any hesitation saying no, I mean saying yes to you now. Since it's continued to work and you've worn down my resistance and I'm open-minded to you, because of all these psychology of influence things I've just shared with you, I'm gonna say yes. So one example would, have you guys been receiving emails from any of the political parties for donations in the last few months? A lot of the time they're written like this. Are you in support of you know, um, Trump's um, uh, you know, um, jailing of toddlers at the Mexican border, right? And they'll write it like that too. It's a leading question. And you're gonna say, no. 
Okay, do you like the position that Elizabeth Warren has taken regarding that or any of the other, you know, yes, I like that. Okay, are you in agreement that there should be more accountability in politics? Yes, I like that. Do you think that there should be more honesty and less dealing with foreign governments on political elections in the United States? Yes. Do you, do you um, in, uh, support the um, investigation towards the impeachment of the president? Yes. And these are all easy yeses so far. Then they're going to say, okay, now, now click the button, boom. Since you've said yes to everything that we've asked you so far, are you now ready to make a $3 campaign contribution? Well, yeah, you've already gotten my heat built up so much on all these other issues, and I've said yes all the way along. I'll give you three bucks. So then you push that button, and they give you, okay, I'm ready to contribute. $19, $25, $35, $50, $75, $100. Nowhere in there have they listed the $3 that you just said yes to. Have you seen this? Is this what you've seen? It's exactly what it is. So what they've done is they've, they're basing this on consistency. Okay. Now, oftentimes, when these emails come out, it's going to look like, hey, you know what? Joe Biden just sent me an email. It's going to say an email from Joe Biden. And here's this letter written to me. Hey, Joe, you know, it's Joe Biden. I wanted to take your time and ask you what you think about President Trump. Well, he's an authority, right? And if I'm a Democratic voter, I might be into Joe Biden. They're at least leveraging that authority factor right there, right? Et cetera, et cetera. So, so you can see how that's playing out. That's the consistency thing, yes. Ask you a bunch of easy yeses and then go in for the kill with the hard one. But you've already said yes a hundred times and you're going to say yes to this one too. So where do we see the different elements of social influence playing out with the different shopping tools that we've been talking about? Social proof. Social proof is what? What's, what's the example I gave you, or what, is, what does social proof mean? Something totally new and how, how you look at other people so you can learn from them how to deal with the problem. Excellent. Okay, so we use social proof on things like lists, right? Meaning, I found on a Pinterest list or on a bunch of different Pinterest pages the same brand or product listed over and over and over again. Huh, there must be something to that. Recommendations, same thing. Referral programs, same thing. Reviews, same thing. Um, testimonials, another example. User forums and user galleries, these are all examples of social proof. Okay? The next one would be authority. Authority, I pick some figure who's important in an industry or important in a particular community, and I use that person as my spokes model, right? Or my spokes authority. So where do we use it? Recommendations. Hey, if Tom Brady or Walter Payton told me to buy this, you know, set of cleats or something, I'm going to do it. Those guys know football. Okay. Uh, referral programs, reviews, testimonials. So here, really, social proof and authority, it's really a function of the same thing. It's just raising the level of importance a little bit. Meaning, look, Joe could tell you what to do. But what, Joe doesn't know all that much about football, but Walter Payton or Tom Brady, if those guys are saying this is the real shit, it's probably the real shit, right? Scarcity. Where do we use scarcity? Well, deal directories, deal feeds, group buys, referral programs, storefronts, anything where I'm making you a limited time offer or some sort of a, you gotta act now to get the deal is a scarcity function, okay? Affinity or liking. People in your network, I like them. If they've invited me to do something or suggest that I'm going to listen. Um, deal feeds, lists, rec all of these things. We're using a lot of the same functions, right? Consistency, ask your network. If you're, if you're being asked by people in your network for lots of little yeses and then confronted with the big question, You've been given that consistency thing. We also see consistency in lists and in recommendations, and we see it down here at the even geolocating promotions. Geolocating promotion could be a beacon thing like we started the night off with tonight, okay? Because again, 
It's, it's the, I've gotten you to come into the store already, or you walked past my store already. That was the little yes. Now I'm going to ask you for the bigger one, which is step inside the store. Okay, now I'm making a bigger commitment. Okay, now I want you to actually go over to the, you know, uh, to the sales rack and pick the new jeans up that we're offering on deal right now. Okay, that's another. I haven't bought it yet, but I'm saying yes, 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 everywhere down the line. If I've gotten you to do these little things, finally, when it's time for at, to ask you to pull out your wallet, you're ready to go, right? And then reciprocity. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. You know, um, like a, a group buy, okay, is an example of that. A referral program is an example of that. User forums and user galleries are all examples of that same function. Okay, is that clear? You see how that's all important in leading that, using that whole theory of influence in your marketing? That's really the lecture for tonight. This podcast, Empowered Marketing by Professor Hines, is exclusively sponsored by A-Cubed Marketing Services in Orange County, California. In business since 2013, A-Cubed Marketing offers a complete suite of internet marketing services, including strategic marketing consultation, social media marketing using all forms of social media, campaign creation and management in both paid and owned media, pay-per-click campaigns, search engine optimization, graphic design, and videography. a Marketing is owned and managed by Professor Joe Hines. His experience includes over 20 years of Fortune 100 corporate marketing management, as well as 10 years of academic work as professor at California State University Fullerton, Concordia, Biola, Cal Baptist University, and Fullerton College. Find out more about a Marketing Services Use the link on the home page of this podcast or call a cubed marketing at 714-872-0561.